Snell's law, right, is one of the key equations for understanding optics. It's an equation that basically allows us to determine exactly the angle light is going to change as it passes from one medium to another medium. In this particular example, uh, to, to do the derivation, we're making some assumptions. We're assuming that the first in material, the index of refraction N1 and the index of refraction N2, this one is a lower index than that one. So this would be like the case where you had, uh, you know, like air, and then this could be water or some other material, right? We've done it, I've kind of done it before. So some of the properties of this is that if we have an incident ray coming in, right? When it passes across into the second material, it's going to bend closer to the normal line. Now, what I'm going to prove, what we're going to prove here is going to use some trigonometry to, to work out how sine, the sine of the angles involved here are related to this transition from this side of the, the you know, this, this theta 1, right? Theta 1 is our incident angle. And theta 2, the refracted angle. So, for example, if we reverse this and we were going from water to air, we would change what is theta 1 and what is theta 2. So if you were going from water to air, you would say theta 2 would be your incident angle, or well, you would call it theta 1. You know, you change this to theta 1, change that to theta 2 if you're doing it in reverse. Does that make sense so far? Okay, so, now we got that. Let's get to the geometry because that's the best part of this proof. So, what we want to do is relate theta 1 to theta 2. And now all the geometries in this thing are, are pretty accurate. All these lines are parallel lines going into the medium, and all the wave fronts are perpendicular to the rays. That's just the part of optics, that your wave fronts are perpendicular to your rays. So these rays coming in, right, they go in, and you can see right away that there's a big spacing in the incident wave fronts, and it refracts by geometry alone. The spacing after you get through is a smaller spacing. And this is what we said, you know, as we pass from uh, light, something light to dense, it contracts the wavelength. So now what we need to do is relate that angle to that angle, and here's how we do it. Statement number one. Uh, if I look here, theta 1, and I'm going to call that angle 1, but here's state, statements over here, statements. Right? From the geometries alone of this situation, theta 1 and angle 1, if you look at them, these are perpendicular lines. Therefore, if you combine those two angles, we would say theta 1 plus angle theta 1 plus angle 1 is equal to 90 degrees. Right? Nothing too crazy about that. Now, if we look here, between C and 1, C and 1, they also look the same thing, right? Because the normal line is perpendicular to the surface, if I add angle C plus angle 1, that equals to 90 degrees. Right? So this is the first set of statements we're going to use. Second set of statements. If I look now on the bottom side, on the refraction side, Theta 2 and angle 2, if we add them together, theta angle theta 2 plus angle 2, once again, they're perpendicular to one another if we looked at the whole angle. So theta 2 plus angle 2 is equal to 90 degrees. And on the, if we continue on, looking here at angle D, this is angle D in here. Angle D and 2, if you look again, these are again two perpendicular, they come in perpendicular with the normal line. So Angle 2, right, plus angle D is also equal to 90 degrees. So these are our two sets of statements. We need these to relate these two things together. So, since both these two things plus the angle 1 is equal to 90, what we can say is theta 1, so this tells us that theta 1 is going to be equal to Theta, uh, our angle C. So angle theta 1 is equal to angle C. And if we look down here, combining these two statements together, we can see that theta 2, angle theta 2, is equal to theta D. Right. So far, so good? Right. Okay. Now we actually have to get a little deeper here now. Now, check it out. Since C, since angle C is equal to theta 1. I'm going to define two more lines within the diagram you can't see. 
I'm going to call this little spacing, the spacing between this incident wavefront and that incident wavefront, I'm going to call that L1. It's the length that happens basically between the time that this wavefront strikes the water and the time when that wavefront strikes the water. There's a gap. There's a, lot of, there's a distance gap between those two wavefronts. So we're going to call that L1. And I'm going to call the distance between where these wavefronts strike, so if I extend this all the way up, this distance, I'm going to call that big L. Everybody okay with that? I'm just, it's a spacing between the two wavefronts horizontally, and this little spacing up here is the distance between the wavefronts as they're coming in. So, here's where we get a little deep into the trick. Since we could say that sine of, a, of C, right, is equal to opposite, which is L1, divided by hypotenuse. And if you look at this, it's a big rectangle. So the L up there is going to be the L of the hypotenuse. So sine C is equal to little L1 divided by L. Now I can replace that, right, instead of writing sine C, because I said over here, theta 1 is equal to angle C. Right? I'm going to replace theta 1 in here. So we can say, and this is one of the key statements, we say sine of theta 1 is equal to little l1, that's the distance between the wavefronts, divided by the length. And in the same way, we're going to do the same thing for the bottom. Oops, forgot one. Sine of theta 1, right? On the bottom side, we have the same situation. I'm going to call this little space in here, the spacing between the refracted wavefronts, we're going to call that L2. It's the little spacing, because remember, when you pass between the mediums, the spacing gets smaller, right? So this little spacing between these two wavefronts, after that first wavefront passes through, we're going to call that L2. And so, we can say, we can say sine of D is equal to L2, right? That's the opposite side. L2 divided by uh, our hypotenuse, which is L. And in the same way, because angle D is equal to sine theta 2, we're going to replace this and just say sine of theta 2 is equal to L2 over L. Take a moment. We're not done yet. I know. That's why. We're, that's why. Right? Don't worry. You can review this. Okay. Now here's where we have, we're going to put it all. We're going to put it together. I'm going to get rid of the sine d and the sine c because that's extra crap stuff. We don't need all that extra stuff. So we're just going to get rid of sine c, right? Get rid of sine d, right? Because we now at this point we all understand that. Sine theta 1, which is the incident angle, is equal to that length between the wavefronts after the first spot hits and divided by the length between the horizontal positions where these wavefronts are straight. So we can think for a second, right? This distance, the distance from here to here, how can we determine that distance if we know wave, tra uh, wave light travels at a constant speed? Anybody? How would we figure out this distance, right, if we know light travels at a constant speed? When you travel at a constant speed, how would you figure out the distance? Start from the beginning. What did we learn first in physics? The, the formula. Yeah, what's the formula? D over T. Right. So we know that the velocity of our wave, V, is equal to D over T. So for this little length, one, which is our distance in this case, we can rewrite it as saying L1 is equal to our velocity in the material times the time. Okay with that? Right? And in the same way, for L2, we could say for L2, L2 is equal to our velocity, we'll call that V1, velocity 2 in the material times our time. At this point, right, we've defined the relationship between the sine and these random things, but they're not, you know, this is not very helpful in a general case. 
we want to make this a general equation we can use in any situation. So talking about these lengths are kind of specific. We can relate these two things to one another because they both share a common variable, right? What do they both share? L, L right? So I can rewrite this and say uh, L is equal to uh, theta length 2 divided by the sine theta 2, right? And up here, I can do the same thing. I can say that L is equal to um, L1, little L1, divided by sine theta 1. And now this is where we can connect those two angles together. Because since this equals to L, and that one equals to L, they equal, they equal each other, right? And this is a core piece. So now I'm going to erase this stuff over here. And we're going to say sine theta 1, right? You can say L1 over sine theta 1 is equal to L2 over sine theta 2. Right? This is a core piece of Snell's law. We need this to be able to get to something that's concrete and straightforward. And we want to get rid of these little l's because the little l's are specific to this case and they're not really easy to use in a general sense. Right? We want to relate this to the materials, specifically to the materials. So we needed a couple of pieces that I have over there, which is that uh, we know L1 is equal to V1 times T, and we know that L2 is equal to V2 times T. Now we want to, since we, we want this general for any particular material, the key thing that tells us about the material is the index of refraction. So we want to put this velocity in terms of index of refraction. And we know that n is equal to c over v. That's the equation for the index of refraction. So if I just rearrange it for velocity, I can say that the velocity is equal to c over n. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation, I'm going to get rid of that v, and I'm going to replace it with c over m. And so what I can say is L1 is equal to c over n1 times t. And over here, I'm going to do the same thing. L2 is equal to c over n1 n2. times, oh, sorry, n2, n2 times t. Now that we have this, we can substitute it back into the primary equation. We can say that. Uh, c over n1 sine theta 1 times t is equal to c over n2 sine theta 2 times t, right? Now since they both have the same term on top, c times t and c times t, if we divide both sides by c times t, that gives us 1 over n1 sine theta 1 is equal to 1 over n2 sine theta 2. And to make it nice and simple so we don't have to worry about inverted functions, we times both sides to the negative 1 power, which says our final equation, n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. This is Snell's law. <laughs> no.